Hello everyone, my name is Ben and I work for the Georgian Bay Biosphere Reserve, one of 18 UNESCO Biosphere Reserves found here in Canada. Our region is ecologically unique because we're currently standing in the midst of the world's largest freshwater archipelago, locally known as the 30,000 Islands. Our biosphere stretches 200 kilometers of eastern Georgian Bay shoreline from the French River in the north to the Severn River in the south. The Georgian Bay Biosphere is situated within the treaty territories of the Huron-Robinson Treaty of 1850 and the Williams Treaty of 1920, and located on Anishinaabek territory. Our organization, under UNESCO, acknowledges the rights of Indigenous peoples in this territory and work towards respectful and reciprocal relationships, as we are all caretakers of the land. There are many amazing trails to explore in the region. And today, we invite you to explore the Rose Point Trail with us on this virtual biosphere walk. The Rose Point Trail is a six kilometer trail that stretches from James Bay Junction Road South through to Rose Point Road along the old J.R. Booth rail bed. This trail is a vital link to a larger provincial and regional trail system, including the Park to Park Trail. This trail is also designated one of 20 amazing places in Eastern Georgian Bay. of milkweed and if you're ever walking past milkweed take a look on the leaves because if you're lucky you might find a caterpillar from a monarch butterfly like this one here. Now these caterpillars truly are very hungry caterpillars. A caterpillar like this can munch through a milkweed leaf like this in about five minutes. In fact they're so hungry that when they hatch out from their eggs they eat the egg case and then, as the caterpillar eats and grows, it sheds its skin. And that's something maybe you didn't know about caterpillars, but they do shed their skin. The reason why we never see shed skins from caterpillars is because after they shed it, they eat it because it's a great source of nutrients to help them prepare to turn into a butterfly. So here we have a very hungry caterpillar. If you joined us on our virtual biosphere walk of the Humphrey Trail, you might remember that we found a very special flower called the blue bead lily. When we found it in the spring, it was still flowering. But now we're here later in the summer and we found a different patch of blue bead lily on the Rose Point Trail and you can see that they've now gone to seed. Not only have they gone to seed and formed the blue bead where they get their name from, but you can see that something has actually eaten it. You remember we said it looks kind of like a blueberry. Uh, but it's not actually edible to humans. That, of course, doesn't mean that it's not an important food source for wildlife. As we can see here, something has clearly enjoyed a meal. One of the things that you've probably noticed about our region is that it's very rocky. But what many people often don't realize is that our region used to be home to an ancient mountain range known as the Grenville Mountains, approximately 1.3 billion years ago. And now all we see today of this mountain range is the deeply buried roots, um, which gives geologists a great window into the mountain forming processes of today. Along the Rose Point Trail, there are lots of wetlands, including this creek. And if you're at the edge of the wetland, you might want to stop and look for frogs. There are several species of frogs that you can find around here, but one of the most common species is called the green frog. Now, green frogs, despite their name, are not always bright green. Sometimes they can be more of a brown color. But either way, all green frogs are typically pretty plain in color. They don't have a lot of patterns on them. Now, 
I was hoping to find a green frog here, but I guess that frog just couldn't kermit to it. So we've stopped here at another wetland and what I want to point out with this one is that there's a couple of fallen trees back there and even though you might wonder well what good is a tree once it's dead and in the water it's actually really useful uh, and especially for turtles so there is a small painted turtle basking on one of those fallen trees back there it'll be a little hard to see in the background of the video but if you come out here, you'll probably see them. Um, there's a lot of logs like these where you can see turtles. So the turtles are basking, but why are they doing that? So early on in the spring when it's cooler, they're basking so that they can warm up in the sunshine. Remember, uh, turtles are cold blooded. And even though that's kind of a weird word, their blood's not truly cold. Really, it just means that they don't have the ability to regulate their own body temperature. So they have to sit out where it's warm in order to heat things up and then they can move around better. But now it's July, so what is this turtle doing out here? It's hot today. Well, later in summer, turtles don't necessarily need to warm up, but they do need to let their shell dry out from time to time. And this prevents algae growth and it prevents disease and parasites and overall just strengthens the shell. So probably this painted turtle is hanging out on that log, enjoying the sunshine, just keeping that shell nice and healthy. So we found another pretty neat plant on the Rose Point Trail. If you have a look here, you can see what's called Indian pipe very commonly. Other names for it include corpse plant or ghost plant. And when you look at it, you of course notice that it's completely white, hence the name ghost plant. Now, because it's completely white, you might not even think it's a plant. You could think it's some kind of a weird mushroom, but it's actually one of nature's weirdest wonders because it's indeed a plant, but it doesn't have any chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is what makes the leaves of different plants green. It uses instead a symbiotic relationship with a fungus to, get, to gain its food. No chlorophyll, no photosynthesis, that means it can grow in really dark places, like some of these shady spots on the forest floor. So we stopped here, something caught our attention as we were going down the trail, and we have gypsy moth craziness happening right here. So um, what we can point out to you, there's a few different stages in the gypsy moth life cycle that we can see all right here on this tree. So I'll start with these kind of orangey brown furry looking blobs. You might see these on trees. These are egg cases. So it's actually uh, all the little tiny eggs are inside this sort of hairy coating and it keeps them insulated and protected so that they can overwinter as eggs. And then in the spring, the eggs hatch into the caterpillars and probably you saw these this year. It was a, a big year for them. Um, the caterpillars spend some time eating. They love to eat deciduous trees, uh, especially maple and oak and they can defoliate entire trees. So maybe you saw some trees this year and thought, it looks like it's fall, I don't see any leaves up there. Probably there was a gypsy moth infestation. Now, uh, the caterpillars won't necessarily kill a tree if it's just one year of an infestation, but if it continues year after year and the tree is already weak or stressed, then it's at risk of dying. However, for the most part, uh, outbreaks just happen they're usually just one year and then it dies down again. So we have the egg case. We have here, these are uh, the case that the, the caterpillar was pupating in. So it was hiding in here and developing into a moth. And then they break out in, and they are a moth at that point.
So we have some moths here. They look kind of whitish. And so these are all female gypsy moths. The females are a light, sort of light brown or white color. The females stay very close to where they've come out of their cocoon. And so there, there are a few females here. There's also several cocoons. So probably these females came from this tree. Uh, the males, on the other hand, are a little bit smaller. Um, they're more brown in color and they fly around way more. So if you've been walking in the forest and you've had like a snowstorm of moths, those are probably male gypsy moths. They fly around, they find the females and then they mate. So again, we have the female gypsy moth we have the old uh, case where they had the cocoon and we have an egg mass here. Now one plant species I think we could all easily identify is the white water lily. White water lily is very abundant in our area. It grows almost anywhere there's water and it actually is a significant plant for the overall ecosystem. White water lilies are both an important food source, so they're actually very heavy in nectar and very popular with butterflies, with beetles, with different flies, and of course bees, all kinds of pollinators. But the roots, the rhizomes, they're actually an important food source for things like moose and beaver have been known to eat them as well. The leaves are also eaten by a variety of different animals um, and when the flowers go to fruit, we don't often see the seeds, but the seeds are almost fought over by different mammals, including the muskrat. They make up a significant portion of the muskrat's diet overall. But what else is important about the white water lily is its shading effect on wetlands. All of these lily pads actually provide a ton of cover for all the different species of uh, animals living in the water, so your aquatic insects different reptiles, different amphibians, um, and of course fish. And of course that is also through all different stages of their lives. So it's helping to shade the water, protect the animals, cover them, and even cool the water's temperature a little bit. And really overall just creating a better habitat for all the things trying to live in the wetland. Now the other thing that you'll see behind me are all these purple flowers. This is called pickerel weed. And it doesn't offer quite as many benefits as the white water lily, but it's still very important in that it's providing habitat. And the flowers are still very popular with bees and other pollinators. So pickerel weed and our white water lily. no longer spring, we can still see birds, even if we don't always hear them. A couple birds that we saw today on our walk on the Rose Point Trail include turkey vulture and broad-winged hawk. Now the turkey vulture is one that maybe you've seen before, but maybe you don't know much about it. Those are those birds with long wings, big black birds, and they just soar through the sky. A really easy way to learn to identify them is when they're soaring, they hold their wings in a V shape, and you can remember V is for vulture, so turkey vulture. And they soar on thermal updraft, so warm air that's rising. They don't have to flap, they don't have to do any work, they just hang out and soar, circle around, and they use their eyes and their sense of smell to look for prey. And yes, turkey vultures will eat dead animals. That is something they will look for. The other bird I mentioned is a broad-winged hawk. We had a few of these farther down the trail near the wetlands. These are a small type of hawk that lives in the forest and near wetlands, and they make a very high-pitched whistle or whine sound. So if you hear that sound, stop, take a look up around you, and you might catch a glimpse of a broad-winged hawk. Thanks for joining us on this virtual biosphere walk. We hope you enjoy exploring the Rose Point Trail.